I'm honored by the invitation to be here today to talk to you all. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about is the result of a decade-long collaboration with the Krishnamurthy Lab, supported by the Center for Chemical Evolution and paid for by the NSF and NASA. So if we look at this transformation from prebiotic inventory, some undefined prebiotic inventory to, to life, we all recognize this is one of the most uh, meaningful and difficult scientific questions of the day. And the main issue is so much unconstrained chemical space, right, through lots of evolutionary jumps. And so I think the best we can all do as a team in a field is to define areas where we think we can constrain the chemical space, to try to find the bottlenecks in various steps here and help push out from there that, that might help us understand something that happened before and something that happened after. And so the collaboration uh, between Ram and I has been focused on the steps of forming the carbon-carbon backbone of potential building blocks of polymers. And we're really focused on two components. One, how do you form the carbon-carbon bonds? Right? As organic chemists, we know that's a difficult thing to do. And two, once you form a carbon-carbon bond, well, how do you keep it? Right? How do you sustain these molecules from breaking down? So I'm going to refer throughout the presentation to two and three, and these are the ideas of how do you form the CC bond and how do you keep it? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is give you my view of how to constrain this chemical space to form these carbon-carbon backbones of various biomolecules we all might want when building up uh, to, you know, uh, eventually our monomers of our protobiopolymers. And so uh, some of the um, components that I want to stick to in this chemistry is I don't want to form carbon-carbon bonds that just lead to tars, that lead to amorphous solids, right? I'm looking for reactions that give me discrete organic species. And I want to do this under an environment that's compatible with biopolymer, compatible with some of the other steps, the more parsimonious answer to this question of, hey, let's see if we can all do it in the same environment. And I know there's lots of other theories uh, for different, um, uh, more, let's say, harsher environments to do this kind of chemistry, but I'm going to stick to aqueous for this talk. And then I want the carbon-carbon bond formation to be sustainable, that there's some environmental ratchet towards forming these CC bonds that doesn't break down. And I'm going to spend a lot of time today doing some organic chemistry. So the last two I, I've saved for, for the organic here. I want a carbon nucleophile, I mean, carbon that's electron rich and a carbon electrophile, carbon that's electron poor to react together to form my CC bonds. And there's challenges to both of those in an aqueous environment. To get an electron rich carbon, well, the best way to do it is to deprotonate a carbon, but I need a carbon species acidic and acidic under mild aqueous conditions. And that really constrains the carbon nucleophiles that I can potentially use. We can imagine some of them that uh, we, we've thought about in prebiotic chemistry, cyanide, for example, and various types of enols and enolates. But there's issues with all of these, whether it's lack of reactivity or propensity to form TARs, for example. And I'm also going to spend a little time talking about good carbon electrophiles. And the primary problem here is that, well, these are reactive with nucleophiles in the environment, and that's what our 55 molar water is, a nucleophile in the environment. And so we tend to hydrolyze these electrophiles. All right, so I think that fairly strictly defines the chemical environment at which we can form this bond. So we can get some inspirations from biology, but let's not take it too far. In forming a CC bond, let's look at the reductive citric acid cycle. Here's one of the examples of taking a carbon that's an activated methylene with a propensity to form enols or enolates and react with an electrophile in the environment, CO2. This is a beta carboxylation. We form the CC bond, and life is smart enough to do number three after number two, meaning lock that bond down. And locking that bond down by redox chemistry or decarboxylation is a primary strategy of life. We see CC bond formation in lots of other places. <clears throat> and I've labeled a couple of the species here because they're relevant to the talk. In the glyoxylate cycle, for example, we use uh, glyoxylate as an electrophile to form a CC bond nice uh, electrophile to form under uh, aqueous conditions. In gluconeogenesis, we have pyruvate getting carboxylated. There are issues here, right? How do we prevent decarboxylation in a prebiotic environment? And various other reactions as well of activated methylenes and various electrophiles. So there's some pretty good models here and some species I really like, pyruvate and glyoxylate, for example. But we can't use this as an exact model for how prebiotic carbon-carbon bond formation must happen because it's not plausibly prebiotic. 
either we're hydrolyzing the electrophiles or the nucleophiles are too hard to form or the reaction is just too unreactive without enzyme catalysts. So these thought processes coincided with work that Ram and I were doing well, quite a while ago now, and it was on diketopiprazines. And you heard Tom mention these as a problematic trap for dipeptides. And we were looking at ways to make them useful, and we were hydrolyzing a DKP of cysteine. And we were wondering if the, um, we could form a mixture of glyoxide and alanine by hydrolyzing it one way and pyruvate and glycine by hydrolyzing it another way. And what we found from this experiment is that we did get both hydrolysis products, the alanine and the glycine, but we also got a very interesting product with this very distinctive coupling in a proton NMR showing us some diastereotopic protons, meaning there's some chirality in there. A compound we eventually recognized uh, what we call HK3, HKG, hydroxyketoglutarate. And this is the product of pyruvate and glyoxylate and interest forms under mild aqueous conditions. And this reaction of pyruvate and glyoxylate has been a uh, focus, one of our main thrusts of chemistry now for, for seven years. So what we were looking to do to that reaction of pyruvate and glyoxylate is that step three. How do I form that bond through aldol chemistry, but then keep it, right? I don't want to do retroaldol reactions. And so we can take some lessons from life and say, let's use redox chemistry or let's use decarboxylation. In fact, we use both. We threw in hydrogen peroxide, which takes these alpha keto acids and turns them into carboxylic acids. Now we don't retroaldol anymore. And we found an interesting series of reactions that malate oxidized all the way up to malinate. Um, two species important in current biology. Um, then we could continue this reactivity of cycling back and forth between glyoxylate addition um, to add, uh, uh, make larger organic species and then oxidation to lock that bond down. We could do some neat things here. We could cycle, uh, uh, cycle around this ring, for example, multiple times. And some of the components that really attracted us to this chemistry is how clean it is. So on the left, I got a proton NMR, and although lots of peaks, this is just one compound, this is hydroxyketoglutarate. And it was you know, fairly um, uh, um, uh, promiscuous with regards to pH, which reaction would happen, and various buffers. And this is different than what we've seen in previous prebiotic chemistry us and others have done. That's gonna be very, very complex mixtures. And these were simple mixtures in water at mild temperatures and mild pHs. And it did some neat things, as I was alluding to before, for example, turning over multiple times. And we could see that by incorporating C13 labels increasing in increasing number as we turned over multiple times. Uh, and this work was published in uh, 2018 in, in Nature Communicate. And then, as often happens in science, we just got lucky. So we were looking at this reaction of pyruvate and glyoxylate to form HKG. And, well, we just let it go too long. And when this reaction went too long, we started to see some triplets coming up in that proton NMR. And we eventually recognized that those triplets were alpha-ketoglutarate. There's some remarkable things here. Alpha-ketoglutarate is another intermediate to the citric acid cycle. But this reaction, this transition of reduction is how life is locking down that carbon-carbon bonds. And we didn't add any reductant. Right? All we had in here is pyruvate and glyoxylate. What we finally come, came to understand uh, is this, that glyoxylate was acting not just as the carbon source, but also acting as a reductant through its hydride, through a Catazaro-like reaction. In fact, there were two pathways that are both occurring at the same time, and we could watch them both happen. The other was a second addition of glyoxylate to now a dye addition product that underwent a retro, retroclasin with a loss of carbon dioxide to form alpha ketoglutarate. So pretty neat, multiple pathways going to that same compound in quite high yields. So we let this reaction sit more. So we had pyruvate and glyoxylate forming that HKG, recognized that then the glyoxylate again was helping us reduce uh, the dehydrated intermediate to alpha ketoglutarate, and you just leave it longer. And that glyoxylate reacts again in an aldol fashion to form isocitroyl formate. And then that eliminates, I mean, dehydrates in water, neutral conditions, to a conatoyl formate. And those of you who have looked at the citric acid cycle recently or just looked a little bit below on the slide, recognize that that's quite reminiscent to some chemistry that we see in the citric acid cycle, the intermediates. 
So if I compare the TCA intermediates, malate, fumarate, succinate, alpha ketoglutarate, isocitrate, and aconitate, they're just variants of the chemistry we saw from only pyruvate and glyoxylate differing just at this terminal carboxylate, an alpha keto acid versus a carboxylate. And we think there is real good reasons to suppose that alpha keto acid chemistry is a very advantageous chemistry to explore in a prebiotic sense. So this chemistry of the citric acid cycle and these carboxylates, these species are not very reactive at all. You can't get these kinds of transformations to occur without enzymes and cofactors or very harsh conditions. And the key to the alpha keto acids is this acidic alpha carbon that we have right next to this keto group. It's more acidic than we find in carboxylates by five to 10 orders of magnitude. Huge difference by just one keto group. Then, then we can do all sorts of interesting chemistry, like deprotonate to enols and enolates to form our carbon nucleophiles, or dehydrate now to our enone species. And not only do we have that kinetic advantage, but there's some extended conjugation here that drove forward the dehydration reactions that were occurring in water. So really the take home message here without delving too much into the chemistry is that we can get some very interesting carbon skeletons, the kinds that we see in modern biochemistry without using enzymes or cofactors or employing transition metals or harsh conditions simply from two simple starting materials in water under mild pH. So I want to show you a little of the experimental results here. So we can take pyruvate and glyoxylate, and again, take my favorite experiment, the proton NMR, and look at how clean it is. Some of you may not recognize this is clean, but once again, a proton NMR, this is very, very clean. We're seeing just a couple of discrete species in here, that isocitroyl formate showing up, the conatoyl formate, in quite good yields, right? We can go from pyruvate to alpha ketoglutarate in roughly 60% yields, Depending on what conditions you allow me, I can get alpha ketoglutarate to a conatoyl formate in, in virtually uh, quantitative yields. And we can visualize this reaction occurring, the progress of the reaction. So on the top left, I have an HVLC UV diagram starting from a reaction time of zero up to 72 hours. And we can watch this reaction progress along this pathway. We can start either with the biological oxaloacetate in our reaction or the pyruvate, both work great. And as we watch this reaction turn, we can see the HKG, as we call it, um, forming nearly immediately and then going away. And as we wait a little longer, that fumaroyl formate forming and then going away. This peak only so large because of the large extinction coefficient, not because there's a ton of fumaroyl formate. And on from fumaroyl formate, we can watch it go through, for example, to the aconitoyl formate, and so see the transitions of this reaction. And we can see those same high yields uh, by measuring from HPLC as we could from NMR. So we've got what we refer to as a ratchet to these organic molecules through that, that, that two and three. Right, so the organics reacting together through an aldol reaction that happens in water and then reducing to that alpha ketoglutarate. And that's what we think is the really exciting part of this chemistry, right? It's anabolic and then doesn't um, uh, go backwards. However, if we wanted, and let me just preface this by saying we don't, but if we wanted to generate canonical TCA intermediates, we can do that from this reaction simply. Just throw in a little dilute aqueous hydrogen peroxide, and we return our reaction into a flask full of citric acid cycle intermediates. And I think this has been a goal of the field for quite some time, is to generate these citric acid cycle intermediates. But we don't think this is a prebiotically productive reaction. Because to get to these intermediates, well, really what we've produced is kinetically dead organic species. They're not doing any of the interesting organic reactions to generate those carbon skeletons that we want to see in making those building blocks of our, of our eventual biopolymers. So let's look at that citric acid cycle. You know. And so many of us uh, uh, have been trying these transformations, trying to understand how to get the citric acid cycle, either reductive or oxidative, to go. And the chemistry just doesn't, right? Unless we bring in very harsh conditions, and even then, the number of transitions transformations that we can do is quite, quite low. And that's again because, well, these are poor electrophiles and poor nucleophiles. And so going to these kinds of intermediates is not the kind of chemistry we want to do. 
until we've developed into a world with some complex catalysts. And then that's advantageous. We can imagine a transformation, I think, from an alpha keto acid world to a carboxylic acid world after there were robust catalysts out there. The inert intermediates of a TCA cycle are something you want with robust catalysts because now you can control them. They don't degrade. They don't do reactions you don't want to do. But before we had those robust catalysts, we could generate these reactions, we could make these carbon skeletons, and we could even drive the reactions forward with that alpha keto acid chemistry. And so I think the take home message from that is that Ram and I have been focusing on making prebiotic analogs of modern biological intermediate. And that's different from a focus that the field has had sometimes before, which is to focus on making analogs of modern enzymes try to find the, the conditions or the stand-ins or the metal or the temperature that enables these kinds of transformations to occur. In our hands, that kind of chemistry has been unproductive. The chemistry we found to be quite productive is to go the other direction. Don't rely on analogs to modern enzymes, but find analogs to modern intermediates that do the kinds of chemistry that we want to see happening to build those building blocks that eventually will get us the, the the complex carbon species we need to generate you know, um, the protobiopolymers uh, that we need. And so if I look at the, uh, the, the kind of chemistry that we now see in this alpha keto acid pathway and compare it to the chemistry we see in the glyoxylic acid cycle uh, and the TCA cycle, you can see lots of parallels between the two and even a simple evolutionary jump from one to the other by just going into, by, by oxidizing this species. And so here's our chemistry. And again, just pyruvate and glyoxylate sending us down this pathway, glyoxylate being both a carbon species we add and the substrate that then is a reductant. And so we can imagine why an alpha keto acid protometabolism rather than a carboxylic acid one is advantageous in an early biotic world. We see CC bond formation, we see mechanisms to, to lock it down through reduction. And we can imagine why evolution to a carboxylic acid metabolism, at least mostly, might be very advantageous in a later biotic world. And in that later biotic world, and even in the modern metabolism, we see some alpha keto acids remaining. So in the citric acid cycle, we have alpha ketoglutarate still, and we have oxaloacetate still. And these species are quite useful. In fact, we generate through transamination amino acids out of them. And I think it shows some of the really interesting metabolism you can get from alpha keto acids, or even really just chemistry that you can get from them to secondary uh, metabolites. And so maybe we can envision modern biology having kept these around because they are so synthetically useful, but otherwise having oxidized to the more, let's call them kinetically inert species. So the major themes of my talk have been, you know, let's focus on the highly constrained chemical landscape of a carbon skeleton. If we want to say that we want these reactions to occur in the same environments, that we want to see our catalytic biopolymers emerge, there's not that many options to getting them with a focus on what can be a carbon nucleophile and what can be a carbon electrophile productively. And that let's focus on analogs of metabolic intermediates. So let's take inspiration but from biology, but not depend on the intermediates we see from biology to be our prebiotic components, and maybe move away from looking for analogs to, to catalyze reactions of the modern biological intermediates. And that there are real advantages to exploring an alpha keto acid protometabolism over a carboxylic acid one, particularly in an early biotic world. And there might be, one can imagine, that an evolutionary pathway from an alpha keto acid protometabolism excuse me, to a carboxylic acid one. So the next step of our work is to do what biology has done as the second layer on this TCA cycle, which is let's bring nitrogen into the game. So we've been looking at turning our alpha keto acids that we generate through transamination into a variety of amino acids that might be biologically useful and also looking at the synthesis then of nucleobases from this alpha keto acid chemistry. And Ram and I have made some neat progress that hopefully we'll be able to show to you uh, this year. So I want to thank Ram Krishnamurthy, who's been an incredible collaborator and mentor for 15 years. 
And then Furman University's undergraduate research program. So some of the undergraduates have done a great deal of work on this project and heard in the audience today. And none of this chemistry would exist without the CCE and the leadership of Nick Hudd and the daily day-to-day -day grind that Christine Conwell has put in to make this all happen. So I want to thank you all for your time and attention and NSF and NASA for their support. Thank you.